Oh, hello everyone. Great to see you here. Uh, we're about to get started. Just allow a couple of more uh, minutes for people to join in. I can see that there are people joining all the time. So while we're waiting, why just you don't write to the chat and tell me a, a little about uh, yourself. Do you have a puppy at the moment? Uh, how old is it? So please write in the chat. Uh, how, how old is your puppy if you have a puppy at the moment? Or if you don't have a puppy, just write what uh, breed of dog you have and how old that dog. Right, so it's a got a 13 week old golden retriever, Irish water spaniel, six years and 12 years, uh, 11 month old English Springer spaniel, some Weimar honor, cocker spaniel, more cocker spaniels, uh, spinone. Oh, there's a lot Springer spaniels, Welsh Springer spaniels, and golden retrievers, Labradors, Labradors, cockers, flat coated. Oh, I thought I saw a Vizsla running by, a spinone. Uh, a taller Münsterlander are great. So there's all sorts of, of uh, breeds joining in here, both a bit older dogs and some puppies. Uh, but I know that uh, the principles that I'm going to talk about here today uh, will be great both for puppies and for older dogs. And even if you have an older dog now, you might be getting a puppy in the future and then you can apply all of uh, the concepts to that new dog. So lovely. See people joining in here still, but. Now, uh, I think that we will get started. And if you're joining in a bit later, just please write in the chat uh, what dog you have. Do you have a puppy now or how old is it? So what we are going to talk about here today is Gun Dog Foundation. Uh, but the great thing about Gun Dog uh, Foundations is that you could use them for all, all types of dogs. Even if you don't have a gun dog, you could benefit from this as well, because who doesn't want to have a dog that will come back uh, when cold, who will stop when um, games fly up, or who will walk nicely by your side through town. So please use all these principles in every area uh, that you might be training. So uh, adapt them to your, to your obedience, to your everyday life, and your gun dog training. Here's a, a bit about me. Uh, my name is Elsa Blomstedt. Uh, I've written the book Retrieving Four Locations together with my colleague Lena Gunnarsson. Uh, at the moment, I've got uh, two or maybe two and a half Labrador. I'm picking up uh, a puppy on Sunday. And uh, my older Labrador uh, to the left in the picture, Keen, is living with me at the moment. And the younger one to the right in the picture is living with a friend of mine because his elbow unfortunately stopped uh, the hunting career for his part. I'm based in Gothenburg uh, in Sweden, and I've been a dog trainer since 2005, giving courses both uh, IRL and online. So a bit about tonight then. Um, I just wanted to let you know that this webinar is for um, you who want to teach your puppy great foundations. You might be a first time gun dog owner, or it might also be the first time that you want to train your puppy using reward-based methods. If you have any questions during the webinar, please ask them in the Q&A section of uh, Zoom, and I'll be able to get back to them later. If you write them in the chat, they tend to get lost. So use the Q&A section, and we'll come back to questions um, at the end of the session or at uh, places where I know that this question will fit. So tonight, uh, I think that you're going to find this women a bit different and unique because the things that I'm going to talk about, they are so easy to implement that straight after the webinar, you will be able to take action. And you will also notice that something that I talk about a lot, a lot is that dog training should be fun. It should be fun for you. It should be fun for the dog. I've had so many students saying that I didn't know that dog training could be this much fun. Uh, and also saying earlier when I trained my dog, I was always annoyed. But now we're both so happy and we're getting the results I want. So this way of training your dog really makes both you and your dog happier. 
I know from experience that this works, and science has shown it as well. And also, I don't know if you know, but the military has actually been training dolphins to find underwater explosives using reward-based method as well. That's pretty cool. So I've seen so many students implement this training structure and get a better uh, connection with the dogs, having a more harmonic everyday life with them and understanding them so much better. And the training has become much more efficient as well. So what I have to give you tonight is uh, a training plan for teaching your puppy, get no puppy, great foundations. So as I said before, you will actually have very concrete ideas of how to move forward after this webinar. But we don't have that much time. So uh, I hope you'll see that what I'm talking about today will be valuable for you. So bring out your pen and pad or take notes on your iPhone. And also at the end, I will share with you where you can find more information and that get further help along your journey if you want to do that. Okay, so first of all, I just want to ask you one thing, and that is, do you consider yourself to be an action taker? Uh, so after hearing these new ideas in this webinar, will you be able to take action? If you consider yourself to be an action taker, please write yes in uh, the chat so that we can see that you're all participating. Yes, great. Emma, Monica, Martin, Lynn, great. I'm really happy to see that because I really want you to be able to take these ideas and apply them and use them so that you could feel that you move forward in your training. So I'm really happy to see that there's a lot of action takers here today. Uh, Kirsten, Jane, Annette, Randy, Christopher, Mel, Helen. Oh, great. That feels really good. So let's get started. I know that you might be facing quite a few challenges. When uh, getting your puppy home, you might be feeling overwhelmed. There's so much thing, so many things that you want to teach your puppy. You might be wondering where to start or when to start uh, the training. You might be feeling anxious. Will I be able to make it? Can I take care of this puppy in the best way? Will I reach my goals? But there is, of course, a future. And your desire for the future might be that you want to feel confident that your training will work. You want to have a clear structure to follow and you want to feel happy when training. So who here resonates with that? Let me know in the chat. Is there something that you desire for the future? Just type, type yes in the chat if this resonates with you. Yes, great. Absolutely, yes. Perfect. I'm really happy to, to hear that because that, that is what I want to send with you today. Yes, Karen, May, Sandra, Liz, happy to see that. Yes, and Susan as well. Perfect. Okay. So, I'm running down a hill. I hear the leaves being crushed beneath my feet and I see some snow on the ground quite chilly outside. But most importantly, I see a red long line disappearing through the leaves in front of me. In the other end of the line, there's my Goldie, Ludde, running around happily playing with a dummy. He's having the time of his life. Me, <laughs> not so happy. Quite frustrated, actually. Um, the plan was to send him for a mark retrieve that he should run out, pick it up, and promptly come back to me and deliver it. That really didn't happen. So now I'm chasing this long line, and I really don't like running. So I strongly felt that there has to be a better way of doing this. It's so inefficient chasing him with the dummy, and he's way faster than me. So this was my first gun dog course. I had been training quite a bit of competitive obedience before, and they restructured the training entirely differently. We rewarded the behaviors we wanted, we set up the dog to succeed, and we broke larger behavior chains into smaller details and practiced them separately before we put them all together. 
So I realized that I should bring that way of training into my gun dog training. So after doing that, the deliveries with Luda started to work great. And we had so much fun, both of us. And then I realized that this is how I want to work. And more and more people got interested in this way of training. I started to give courses. And after a while, I also wrote the book Retrieving Four Locations together with my colleague. And now I've met hundreds of students in real life and online who also want to train their dogs this way. So my big revelation was that reward-based training is a very efficient and fun way to create great foundations for your gun dog puppy or and for your older dog as well. And this is what we're going to talk about more tonight. We're going to start with the train, prevent, interrupt framework. And there's something that we base all our training on and that biggest structure that you use in all our training. So let's roll up our sleeves and get into it. We start with training. We train the behavior we want. We reward the behavior we want. We find rewards that make it worthwhile for the dog to do the behaviors that we want it to do. And the training part is what will have the most effect on the behavior. We're actually teaching the dog what we want it to do. Then we have the prevent circle. We prevent unwanted behavior from happening, especially when we're not actively training so that the dog doesn't learn things that we don't want it to learn. And if what we don't want to happen still happens, we find a way to interrupt it and gently stop the dog from doing it without intimidating it. And here's the important part. This part isn't training. It isn't teaching the dog what we want it to do. It's just stopping it from rewarding itself from doing things that it shouldn't do. So we don't want to scare the dog. We just want to stop it from self-reward so that we then can continue to train the behavior that we want. So let me give you an example. Most puppies love taking stuff into their mouths. Well, then they might wander off and start chewing it. That will result in broken stuff or me having to take the pup to the vet to get the stuff out of the puppy, which could be both dangerous and expensive. So if I follow the train prevent interrupt protocol, I then start with training. I teach the puppy to bring the stuff to me. So when I have puppies, I tend to have heaps of different stuff on my desk, uh, shoes, toys, pieces of paper, well, whatever they can find, because uh, they bring it to me and I reward them for that because I find that to be much better than them wandering off chewing on that stuff somewhere else. And I also teach the dog to pick it up, to pick up its own toys instead of my shoes, for example. So that's the training part. Then I also want to prevent this behavior from happening because as you all know, puppies are quite creative. And if there's opportunity to do something that they find interesting, well, then they will take. So I put the shoes on the hat shelf or I put some compost fencing in front of the shoe shelf uh, so that the puppy can't reach the shoes. The interest in picking everything up and chewing on it, well, it usually disappears as the puppy grows older. So when this puppy has learned not to take everything it finds, well, the shoes then can move back to the shoe shelf and I don't have to stretch to, to reach the shoes. And the final part, the interrupt. If the puppy takes something that it really shouldn't have, something that can be really dangerous and doesn't come to me with it, I might have to go after the puppy. But I always keep in mind that this can turn into a fun game of keeping away, you know, the puppy thinking that I'm chasing it, uh, looking at me playfully and tries to keep away even more. And I don't want that. So I just as calmly as possible want to interrupt the dog. I might actually just take a treat and put it on the nose of the puppy so that I could get the object back, the thing that I don't want the puppy to have. And then, of course, could also give it the puppy a toy or something that it's allowed to have. So I just call my interrupt the dog, remove the object that I wanted to have, uh, and give it an option that is better both for me and for the puppy. Okay, so 
I hope this makes sense and that you understand a bit about how the framework works. Uh, I will soon go into more detail and talk about how to apply it in different areas. But first, I just wanted to ask you a question about it. Where do you feel that you yourself usually end up in the train prevent interrupt framework? Do you tend to actually train the behaviors you want? Do you feel that you're a little behind, so you have to interrupt the behaviors all the time? You have, there's a lot of unwanted behavior going on in your life, or are you good at preventing them? So, so where do you put most of your focus? Where, where do you feel yourself ending up? A little behind, yeah, in the interrupt part. Some of my thing. Anyone else? Where do you feel yourself ending up? Train, prevent, interrupt. Train, train shape and get it right. Try to focus mostly on proactive training. Yes, great. Prevent and train. Good. Interrupt. Yep. It's very easy to end, end, end up in an in, in interrupt. All three. Yep. Try to prevent by coming a bit short in the interrupt. Yep. Train, very good. Prevent and train, good. Plan ahead for my training sessions, yes. Good. And that's also what I want to encourage you to do. Train and prevent, but unleash, often interrupt. Yeah. So we're going to look into more how we can do that. And after the webinar, I hope that you will be feeling even more confident and working on all three parts of the framework, but mostly, of course, in the training part, because that's what we're going to make the biggest difference. So, as I said before, uh, a training plan for teaching great foundations to Uganda Pavi. That's what we're going to achieve here tonight. And I'll do that by showing you how to implement the train, prevent, interrupt framework in different areas. So, I'll be sharing three strategies with you and this is something I teach in all my courses and I do it myself with all my puppies so it's not just something that I tell you to do I actually do it myself as well so the first strategy uh, I call it be the sun sounds great right <laughs> but I want to be the sun in my dog's life because that makes everything so much easier uh, by having fun together with my dog, by being the one who initiates fun activities, both during our training sessions and on our walks, uh, and rewarding my dog for the behaviors I want, we're building a great relationship. The dog enjoys being with me, and I have as much fun being with the dog. So I reward everything that I like, and I also make sure to find rewards that my dog likes. So everything that my dog likes, well, that I find acceptable, uh, I can use as a reward. So if, uh, for example, I know that my dog really loves to run over and greet people, uh, I might first ask the dog to sit, and when it does, I'll give it a release cue so that it can run over to my friend, for example, and my friend can pet it, pet the dog and color it and so on. Uh, I could also do that. I have my dog walk to heel, and when it's done that for a couple of steps, I could give it a release cue and tell it, okay, now go on, go, go sniff, go enjoy yourself. Uh, it sniffs for a while, and then it comes back to do some continued training. If the dog responds quickly when recalled, I might also give the dog a, a release cue and to go swim in the stream nearby, uh, if the stream is safe and if my dog loves to swim, obviously. But having retrievers, I'm having a bigger problem keeping my dogs out of the water. So for them, it's really great when I say, there you go, and they could go swim. So also, when the puppy is young, they tend to follow you around. Reward that. Because soon the puppy will grow up, it will start to venture off into the world and find its own interests. So then it's really important to keep rewarding your dog for coming back to you, keeping an eye on you, and also to prevent itself from self-rewarding or doing things that you don't want it to do. 
So try to figure out fun activities that you could do on your walk. For example, you could hide some treats on the ground or you can hide them in a tree. When the dog comes back to you, you could let it chase a treat or a toy to make them even more fun. And you could do a few small exercises like hand target or teach dogs to spin before you continue your walk. And then after a while, you stop and you do uh, another little activity and then you walk on and so on. You could reward a puppy for walking by your side and then you can make a game out of trying to sneak away and reward the puppy for following you and coming back to your side. And also coming back to the train prevent interrupt framework. If you let your dog practice chasing birds on the beach every day, it will be much more difficult to teach it to be steady and not chase birds when you're walking in the park or when you're hunting. Uh, so if the dog still manages to do something you don't want it to do, for example, chasing those words, but you have to find a way to interrupt it without intimidating it and then go back to training. A great exercise that we do with all our dogs, starting from when they're really, really young, or only puppies, from when they bring the puppy home, and that we also have all our students doing on our recall courses, is to reward contact on their walks and reward the dog for checking in so that I don't constantly have to watch the dog and make sure that it's following me, that I really could rely on that the dog actually is following me. So at the start of the course, we ask our students to take a walk uh, and count how many check-ins the dog does. Most of them start out at perhaps three to five check-ins during such a walk some of them with no check-ins at all. And then we ask them to reward every check-in during the week and count again at the end of the week. So on average, they will have improved by 337%. That is, they will be getting 30 to 40 uh, check-ins instead. So from an average, perhaps three to five, 10 check-ins, and then up to 30. You can imagine the impact that that has on their walks and on the relationship with their dogs. Another example of this actually being the sun in your dog's life is Bobby. I met Bobby, the short haired pointer, on a course a couple of years ago. Um, his owner didn't bear to having me loose during the course or off leash because he would run off and not come back. So I asked if something had happened to make him not want to come back. And it turned out that on the last course that uh, they had attended, he had run off. And all the other course participants and the instructor had been yelling at him for running away. So thus he didn't want to, to come back. What we did during this course was that we worked with Bobby on leash for a couple of sessions. We rewarded him for following his owner. And we worked on delivery to hand, and that worked well as well. And then we worked with him off leash, continued to working on, on the contact, the check-in, following the handler, and that worked really well until he got a bit tired and all of a sudden decided to wander off. And you know, the point is they have quite long legs. They are pretty fast. Uh, so he quite quickly ended up 50 to 100 meters away, but all the while keeping an eye on his owner to see if she was going to follow him. So we decided not to do that, but instead we had a great party where we were. Uh, we played with toys, we played with treats, we made interesting sounds. And all of a sudden, he was so interested that he came back to us and we rewarded him a lot for that. He got treats and we played for him. For the rest of the course, he worked so beautifully with his own. It was such a joy to see. Not a single thought on running away or leaving her because all of the great stuff was ha happening with his handler. After the course, we even got a message from uh, his owner telling us how happy she was that she had attended the course and how much better everything worked with him now that she had learned to reward the behavior she wanted instead of uh, looking more at the behaviors she didn't want and also how much more fun that had made training for both Bobby and herself. 
So the first strategy, being the sun. If you think about it, if you were to become the sun in your dog's life, what impact would it have? How do, how would you imagine that your walks would feel? Would if would there be a difference from today? Would it be uh, an improvement? Do you feel that you're there today? But if you were to become the sun in your dog's life, how would it feel? Please type out in the chat. Rewarding, yes. I love this question, great. <laughs> More fun to train, rewarding, yes, definitely. Fun, empowering, relaxing. Yeah, definitely, you know, you could, you could walk, you could trust that your dog will follow, follow you, you have fun together. Like we've overcome a big hurdle, definitely. Rewarding, yeah. <laughs> kind of hope that I already am, but I could shine a, a bit brighter. Yes, that's really, really good. Uh, and you can, of course, uh, feel that you're really already doing that and that's great so then I just want to encourage you to shine brighter that's a really nice way of putting it sunny day fun I'm already the sun feels special yes that's perfect happy to hear that vast increase in the bond with my dog definitely having a strong relationship yeah I'm be I'm becoming a little happy just from reading your comments I would be more confident yeah great so let's move on to the second strategy, and that is to make sharing worthwhile. Maybe someone has told you, you don't have to teach a uh, retriever delivery to hand. Uh, they know it by nature. Uh, and if you have that type of dog, I just want to say, lucky you, congratulations, perfect. Just keep reinforcing that. Because for a lot of dogs, it's not that obvious that the first choice is to come back to you when they have something. I actually think it's quite understandable that they don't want to and that it is difficult for a lot of dogs because they've been chasing the prey and now it's time to eat. And then someone comes along and asks them to give it up. So even though we've been breeding our Spaniels and Retrievers with a focus on, on sharing and bringing them with them is and, and game back to us, it doesn't come 100% natural to all of them. So for quite a few of these dogs, you really have to work with it a lot. So I have to actually make sharing worthwhile for the dog. I was sitting on the red carpet of a bed and breakfast in the UK. I was playing with my new puppy seeker. We had picked him up from the breeder just a few days earlier, and we were on our way back home to Sweden. So both he and I enjoyed the game, hugging. However, when I wanted him to give me the toy, he didn't want to let go. Not until I traded it for his bowl of minced meat, he was happy to give it up. So then I there, I realized that hmm, this was not the type of dog that would happily bring stuff back to me. So I would have to work a lot on making him realize that it's actually worthwhile to do that. Since delivery to hand, of course, it's crucial for uh, a retriever. I started straight away. I rewarded him every time he came to me with something in his mouth. He gradually got better and better at it. And then I moved the game outside and did the same thing. Uh, outside, I realized that when he got a bit too wound up, he no longer sort of remembered what I wanted him to do and what we've done before. So outside, I had to have uh, a bit more of a, a prevent strategy. So uh, when he got frustrated, he otherwise started to, to run around with the objects. Uh, and in that situation, of course, it's quite easy to feel frustrated or getting angry or starting to chase the dog. But since I don't want to train that way, um, I prevented it from happening by either having him on a leash or actually, which is sort of more my favorite thing to do, is to put the object on the leash so he can't run away with the object. If he tries to, to run away, the object will stay with me. So we're having the object together. So I continue to reward him 
for giving me the objects and gradually increasing the difficulty and adding distractions. Very important, adding distractions. We'll get back to that. Uh, I prevented him from running around. And I also knew that if I did more than three repetitions, uh, then he would, <laughs> uh, he, he would just lose it and not be able to focus anymore. So I did three repetitions. I took a short break uh, so that he could keep his focus when I started over again. And if he still managed to run away, which uh, happened occasionally, I interrupted him by recalling him or just asking him to sit so I could walk up to him and get back into training mode again. So all of this combined made him realize that it's actually quite worthwhile to bring me stuff. And at the first hand test that we attended, the judge said that he had an excellent delivery at the hand and that really felt like a victory. So when we start doing the delivery to hand, this is actually one of the most common things that our students need to work on. Uh, it's both bringing objects back, getting the dog to deliver the objects to their hand and not just dropping it by their feet and doing it when there's distractions around. And that's also why it's all the first thing that we start with, both when we get our puppies home and uh, on our courses. So we teach the dog to put the nose against our hand, a hand target, so that we don't have to stretch to get the object, the dog brings it to us. Uh, I don't want to play goalkeeper and having to put my arms out this way or that way to get the object. I want the dog to bring it to me. So first we teach the hand target without the object. Uh, and then we play with the dog and encourage the dog to come to us to continue to play and combine it with the hand target. Then. The final and maybe most important step is to add distractions. Because we also have so many students say that, well, I can't use treats when I'm training the delivery because my dog will just spit the, the object out or and try to take the treats instead. That's why we want to teach the dog to continue to do what I ask, ask it to do, continue to bring me the object, even when there's distractions around. I just don't want to hide the treats because then I have to hide a lot of other distractions as well because I can't control all distractions that we might find when we're at training or trialing. So here in the picture, you might uh, think that this is impossible to achieve, but I can tell you it's not. Here, Diesel, my Goldie, has learned that it's much more rewarding to pick the dummy than to take the hamburger. I can also tell you that this is not the first repetition, not the first time we're doing this. We've done lots and lots and lots of lots of repetitions where she's learned that picking up the dummy and bringing it to me is very rewarding. And I've had a helper removing the hamburger if she wanted to take that one instead. She is a very, or was, she was a very food motivated dog. She would happily eat the hamburger uh, if I had said that she could which I also did uh, actually after this training session where we took this photo. Um, but this is really the power of positive reinforcement. We've done so many successful attempts that the dog will pick the dummy over the hamburger and bring me the dummy. Well, there's of course not that many hamburgers around on a hunt test, uh, but we teach other distractions the same way. The hamburger is just a fun way to show it. And all of a sudden, there might have been someone putting down his uh, rucksack with some sandwiches in it and just next to where my dog is going to deliver the dummy or the game. So there could be similar distractions as well. So it's not a bad idea to practice with a hamburger. I don't know what type of dog you have, but or what the type of dog your puppy is going to grow up to become. But after hearing this, I just want to know, could you commit to actually making sharing worthwhile, to reward your dog and to make it worthwhile for it to bring you the objects back? Write commit in the chat if you're with me on this. Absolutely. Great. Commit. Perfect. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> My dog brings me stuff all the time. It's his best game. Great. Commit, of course. 
Great, Jane, Annika, Ken. Yes, I'm happy to see that you're with me. Yes, but harder in the morning. Okay, yep. <laughs> Hell yeah, best thing in the dance world. Absolutely great. Yes, so happy to hear that. Perfect. Because as I said in the beginning, it doesn't come all natural to all dogs. And also keep in mind that this isn't really a natural behavior, you know, uh, catching something and then give it up, giving it up to some someone else. Um, then you really have to pay well for it. Yes, even the cushions. <laughs> yep. So the third strategy I wanted to, to share with you is to encourage self-control. Something really, really important to do. And for a puppy, the tiniest leaf blowing in the wind or a bird flying by in the distance or a child playing nearby is a huge distraction. And later on in our gun dog work, steadiness is very, very important. Spaniels, well, they should flush game and retrievers should be able to walk by your side while game is being flushed. Uh, in your everyday life, it is important as well, you know, not, not just running through the door or jumping out of the car as soon as you open it. So therefore, it's important to, to encourage self-control from the beginning so that the dog learns that it's really rewarding to control itself. And that's also because we don't want the dog to learn the wrong things, like chasing game or running around without their permission, because we will not have end up in the situation that we want to harshly punish the dog for doing that. So we have to have a really strong reward history of rewarding the dogs, the dog for the things that we want it to do. So I want you to look at the really, really small signs. When the dog already has lunged and is running away, then it's too late. We want to look for the small signs such as stopping, looking at the distraction, maybe looking back at you. That's a really good choice. You've worried that a lot. So really look for these small signs. So I want to share with you another case study of uh, Laba. So this is Laba. Um, the first time I met him and his owner, uh, we stayed within 10 meters of my garden the whole time. Because Laban had a really difficult time focusing, controlling himself, and in general, being steady. We walked back and forth. We rewarded him for showing just a little tiny bit of self-control. And then in between, we gave him short breaks um, so that he could just go sniff and clear his mind a bit. Perhaps we just threw some treats on the ground for him to find, or when you say, there you go, you could go, go sniff over there. Uh, since being well, a dog, he loves to sniff and just take a, a short uh, wee and then come back into training. The important thing here was that we want to take that break before it gets too difficult for it. Because self-control comes at a cost. The dog has to really think about it, keeping itself together. So therefore, we have to be sure to give it breaks and let it just blow off some scene and then come back into training. Well, the same goes for us. We can't be focused for uh, a very, very long time without getting really tired. Of course, with practice, we could increase that time. Uh, but from the start, especially with a puppy or a dog that finds this really difficult, we do short sessions. So anyhow, we continue to work with uh, Laban self-control and steadiness. And gradually, we could add other things as well. We worked with delivery to hand and casting and one stop whistle and, and so on. And of course, his owner got homework in between each session and practiced a lot at home. So, but I remember this day so well, because a couple of months later, after having, having doing one to ones once or twice a month, we walked from my garden through the woods and to the training field, which is about 500 meters or so uh, 10 minute walk further down um, the, the woods. Uh, we walked that path without love and leaving heel position once. And, you know, even if, well, even if it would have been raining, but it wasn't actually. The sun was shining and the birds were singing and I was walking behind him. I was so happy for them because 
uh, Laban's owner had put in so much effort and work into this. And you could feel how much harmonious they were together. Training was so much more fun. And Laban had learned that it was really rewarding to control himself. So if we return to these small signs that I talked about before, on a scale of one to 10, how good are you at encouraging self-control? You know, noticing these small signs and rewarding your dog for them. 10, great. Nine, four, yeah, different. Seven, six, six, nine, seven, great, eight. Perfect, nine, you're really good at this. Happy to see that eight. More eight. Wow, I'm probably five. Yeah, it can be difficult. Six, nine. Yeah, eight, nine. Oh, great, six or seven. Yep. Yeah, just starting to learn. Yeah, nine to ten. Good. If you haven't done this before, it is really difficult with my pup. Seven to eight. Now with my pup, ten. Yes, good. Um, and also, it's it's easier uh, to do this, to ha have time to notice it probably with an older dog because they have learned that being steady uh, is, is rewarding. Uh, a puppy, you have a really short time before, you know, they're looking at something and then they're already over there. So with a puppy, you have to be really, really fast and reward these small, small, small signs of the puppy noticing something and then rewarding it. A clicker is a great aid here. You don't have to have it. You could use a word instead. Uh, but just mark the occasion and give the dog the reward for, for staying in position. So even if the dog is just standing and looking at the distraction, that is so much better than running towards the distraction. Ten, all the time. Everything starts with self-control. Yes, I did really do agree with you, Mel. Perfect. To, to have that with you in the back of your mind all the time. Because self-control is something that we demand from the dogs a lot uh, in the gun dog work and also in our everyday life. So we really have to um, encourage that a lot. Okay, so time's running. Let's just quickly review what we've been talking about so far. Started out with the train prevent interrupt framework. Then I talked about being the sun, how we could apply uh, the train prevent uh, interrupt framework there, about making sharing worthwhile. It's actually really want, getting the dog to want to bring stuff back to us. And then finally, we talked about encouraging self-control and that actually noticing these small, small steps uh, and then they will go uh, occur more often and be bigger so that I actually have more time to notice them. <laughs> Amay says, ha, my puppy used to take his treat and then run for a distraction. Yep, that could be a, be a problem. Uh, definitely. So, so then you have to be re really quick, perhaps put a leash on the dog so it can't run for the distraction. See, I have another question here. My five-year goalie will retrieve, but if there's an interesting sense, she will forget anything else. Yes. Fence are very difficult distractions. Uh, and we train them actually the exact same way as we did with the hamburger that I showed you before, by just gradually moving closer and closer to the distraction, rewarding the, the dog a lot for delivering the objects to us and making sure that uh, we succeed a lot, a lot more than we face. So uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of successful repetition. Oh, yeah, I got an interesting question here as well. Uh, would you recommend treat training or praise training? I guess you mean the difference being in these two rewards that praise would be one reward and treat would be another reward. Um, I tend to do uh, treat training, uh, of course, because I think that that, I will, that is a primary reinforcer, eating something or actually uh, doing doing something, getting something. Praise is something that you learn to appreciate. Some dogs will appreciate that a lot, but for, for most dogs, I say that praise alone is not enough as a reward. 
So I want to find what is really rewarding for my dog. And usually that could be treats, that could be toys, it could be hunting, it could be uh, retrieving and the gun dog work when, once they've learned how to really appreciate that. So one more question here, tips to get from looking at a distraction to looking away at me, my dog fixates. Yes, that is very common. Uh, when they do that, I think that the clicker is perfect because the clicker sound tend to reach uh, better. So I would click and then I would go over to them, put the treat in front of their nose and use the treat to turn them away from the distraction. Give them one, two, maybe three more treats and then take a short break and say, do they look back at the distraction? If they do, I would click again, reward them, bring them back, turn, turn them around away from the distraction and give them a couple more treats so that they learn that it's not just stopping, that is, that is great, but actually also turning back, looking at me, and that will give you more rewards. Okay, uh, we'll come back to some more questions a bit later. Uh, I'll just first quickly review where we started. You know, in reality, feeling overwhelmed, wondering where to start, maybe feeling a bit anxious, uh, and so on. But then I want you to imagine this. Uh, I want to do a real powerful exercise with you. I want you to imagine that in just three days from now, you are initiating uh, fun activities during your walk with your dog and you're feeling happy. Now, I want you to imagine that in three months from now, you are rewarding your dog for de delivering an object to your hand and you're feeling really joyful. Do you see that? And finally, I want you to imagine 12 months from now that you're rewarding your dog for showing self-control, stopping when it sees birds flying off and you're feeling really confident. So what type of person are you seeing in your future? Type out in the chat. How are they showing up? How are they making decisions? And my question to you is, are you committed to being and acting as this person from this point forward? So type that in the chat. What type of person are you seeing in the future? Yes, confident, patient. Yeah, you might need quite a bit of, of patience as well. Steady, controlled, and a proud gun dog owner. Yes, makes me feel feel really happy, positive and happy. Being the sunshine throughout. Getting there, but it has to be a lot of work. Absolutely. Confident, more self confident, and transfer this to my dog. Yes, that is a really good point. Because if you're confident, you will transfer that to your dog. Very happy and confident. Coherent. Yep. Confident and fun. Yes. Great. So, the big question then how? Well, if you're being committed to being that person, the only thing stopping you now is how to get there. And, well, the good news is you don't have to, to guess anymore because I want to share with you how you can reach your goals faster and hopefully easier than you thought was possible, but actually having a great structure to follow and get, dive even deeper into these ideas. First, I just want to say that um, this might not be for everyone. Uh, it's not if you're not willing to be a bit flexible with your approach, if you're happy to just stay in your comfort zone and not interested in analyzing and changing your training. But it is for you if you want to try new things, if you want to take your training to the next level, and if you really want to work reward based with your dog and have fun together with your dog. So if you do, we've put together a new uh, online course that we call Hello, Who's This Then? And the reason to why we created this course, actually me and, me and my colleague, and this is actually 
the course that we've based our second book on. Uh, it hasn't been translated to, to English though yet, but the course is, has been translated to English. But the reason that we created it was that this is the course that we wish that we had when we first started training our puppies. We wanted to have someone to guide us and show us what the next step was. Someone giving us a structure and someone giving me feedback on my train. So during this course, we will create great foundations for your Gundo puppy so that you can have fun and achieve your goals. And of course, without intimidation. The course consists of 10 lessons. We start with the Hello, Who's This Then Part, which is so much fun. You're getting to know your new puppy. You start by studying the puppy to see what characteristics does this puppy have? How should we work with this puppy to adapt the training to that puppy the best way? It might not be that you could do the same things that you did with your old dog. You probably have to do something differently. And then we have the I am the sun, things that we've been talking a bit about, but we're going to dig even deeper into that. So what is important to do or not to do in your everyday life with your dog? And we have rewards. Without rewards, no training. So you have to find rewards that gets your dog going. And of course, yes, you can bring that to me, working with delivery to hand. A lot of puppies need to work on that, as we talked about before. And then the noble art of just hanging around. You know, uh, most dogs, when they get into the gun dog work, they really love to work. They really love to work. Uh, but during a hunt and a trial, there's a lot of waiting time. So we have to teach the dog to be able to, to wait, but not that much happens. And coming back to the self-control, the fun art of self-control, how we do that and how we teach that for both hunting and trials and, of course, your everyday life. Stop. Stopping at the distance to stop whistles, so important, both for spaniels and uh, retrievers. And run, run to where I'm pointing uh, so that you can cast your dog to an area where you, you know that there's something to, to fetch, but the dog hasn't seen it. We have the incredible nose, working with hunting and actually finding objects. And we finish off with water work. What happens when the puppy sees water for the first time? Then there's, of course, a few bonus lessons as well. There's also a few bonuses here for, for you tonight. Uh, when you sign up, you will also get a training plan and a weekly planning so that you could feel confident that you are doing the right thing. You're getting a more structured training. We also have a second bonus, which is a personal feedback. Uh, we give this course in a closed Facebook group where you could uh, upload any number of questions, any number of videos of your own training, and I'll give you feedback on your training and help you move forward. So that way we can ensure that you're always on the right track and that you're actually reaching the goals that you want to reach. We also have a third bonus. As I said initially, I'm getting my own puppy on uh, Sunday. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to train my puppy together with you. Uh, you can watch my training. You're going to watch the ups and the downs because they will be, be downs. And we learn from them as well. And you can ask questions um, to en enhance your own understanding. We've, of course, heard of quite a few students who uh, have attended this already and we've had great reviews. Uh, well, not, not the part where training with me, with my puppy, because all the puppies coming up now, but we've been doing this course before with uh, previous puppies. Uh, and Nancy, for example, said that such great resources presented in a way that nobody else is. My dog will now take, hold and give on request without a bit of force. Great structure, Ellen and River says, I gained a lot from the course and that my dog and me developed during it. And everything in you and thought should be in a course with a few extra tips to boot from Faith and Otto. So to sum it up, we have the course, Hello, Who's This Plan? We have the online course with all the videos and instructions. You have the bonus of the training plan and the weekly training. We have the bonus of the personal feedback and the puppy training. But all in all, we have a total value of 1,190 US dollars. 
I'm not going to ask you to pay that total amount, but just imagine for a moment that you did pay that. And through implementing it, uh, you got a dog that loves to train with you, who enjoys training as much as you do, and that your training was much more efficient than before, and that you reached your goals for your puppy. Do you think it would be worth the investment? Oh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, because you will actually be able to do a lot of stuff with these tools. But as I mentioned before, the, the total value is 1,100 US dollars, but your price is $199. And here are the different options. If you feel that, oh, 199 is a bit too pricey for me at the moment, you could do the course without the feedback. You could settle for just having the lessons, the video instructions, uh, and read and watch the exercises. Or you could do the with feedback, uh, where you have all the exercises, you have the training plan and the personal feedback and the puppy training with me. Or we actually have a third option, and that is uh, the VIP one, which only has 10 spots then you would also get two times 30 minutes one-to-one -one online coaching with me. We do one at the start of the course and one at the, in the middle of the course. That is to really get you off to a good start. And of course, there's also a fast action bonus. If you sign up before midnight tomorrow, and that is mid midnight my time, Swedish time, stuff on time, um, you will also get the five simple steps to master the perfect retrieves uh, one of our uh, online courses without feedback, but that will actually really enhance your understanding of the delivery to hand and uh, play with uh, reverse luring, teaching the dog to bring objects to you, even though there's distractions around. So the total value of that is $90.99. And if you just use the coupon code, Great Foundations, you will get it for free if you sign up before uh, midnight tomorrow. There's also a 30 day guarantee. If you're not happy with the training or the feedback that I'm providing, I'll refund your money. No questions asked, no risk, no hard feeling. You could just feel safe that if this wasn't what you signed up for, you will get your money back. So what to do then? If you're ready to take action, go to retrievingforallocations.com slash trade and pick the option that you want to sign up for. And it's going to show the page to you here. You can see the different options, the without feedback, the, the with feedback, and the full on VIP one. You just pick the one you want and check out. I will also post the link for you in, um, in the chat so you could just copy it from there. And I just have a few questions that I know tend to arise. Uh, and one of them is, I don't know how to upload training videos of my training. And you don't have to upload videos if you don't want to. That is an, an uh, option if you want to do it. Uh, but if you do, we have a guide to help you. The course is being held in a Facebook group. So I think that you might have uploaded videos or uh, photos before. So then you could just do it the same way. Another common question that you get is, will I really learn enough from attending an online course? Isn't an IRL course much better? Well, uh, it depends on how you learn. If you enjoy watching and reading at the same time and uh, being on your own st studying and then get uh, the, the feedback and then continue to do your training, then you learn a lot from an online course. Uh, I actually think that the online course in some senses are better than the IRL course because you could go back to the exercise afterwards. And also when you upload videos, we very often look at, okay, there, uh, one minute and 13 seconds into the video, that happened. That was really good. Do more of that. Or at uh, 15 seconds into the video, that happened. Try to do this next time. So it's a really great tool to have the videos of your training session and get feedback on them. 
And the final question here about the course then is how is the online course structured? Yes, uh, that's a real common question, but you will get, get access to several lessons. You'll have instructions in writing and with videos showing up uh, as well. So you can watch them when it suits you. You will get uh, one new lesson each week. If you've signed up for the course with personal feedback, you'll be able to ask an unlimited number of questions and you could upload an unlimited number of videos. We just ask that you keep them to a maximum of three minutes and we'll get back to you with feedback. If you're ready, take action, go to retrievingforlocation.com forward slash grade and uh, register now. So I will just see a couple more questions here. Yeah, I'm going to look at them before we continue. Okay. My five month year old Working Cocker Spaniel is great at fetch uh, indoors, but outside she's not always too keen to deliver the dummy back. Yeah. Same goes for almost every exercise out outdoors versus indoors. Things are just way more interesting outdoors, I guess. Yes, definitely. So there, I'd say you have to, to work on them indoors first, as you've done. Then you gradually move them outdoors. Keep uh, the sessions short. Keep the distance short and try to be in a, as a... Um, a low distraction environment as possible when you start doing the training outdoors and reward the puppy a lot for continuing to being in the training bubble with you. Try to find different words and see what will work the best. If there is any reward that she will be willing to do almost anything for, then that's a perfect reward to bring out in a high distraction environment. We have a question. I have an 18 month old puppy. Would she be too old for this puppy course? Um, yes, I'd say she's a bit too old for that course, but we do have a foundations course as well that she'd be more suitable for. Uh, or we have an intermediate course, but I, I'd actually recommend that the foundations course instead, because uh, since she's 18 month old, uh, I think she's a bit too old for the, for the puppy course. You can also have a look on our website. And there you'll see specific courses. We have a course on recall. We have a course on stop whistle, stopping at the distance. We have a course on um, delivery to hand, the one, the perfect retrieve you just saw, uh, and, and so on. So you could either do the foundations where we cover several of these areas or pick a specific one. Uh, we got a question here. Is the same offering available in the Swedish site? Yes. Uh, I will actually be doing the course in Swedish as well. So it's definitely available in, in Swedish as well. Uh, we'll be doing, I'll actually be doing this webinar in Swedish as well next week. Both courses are starting up on March the 8th, so, so next week. Uh, so if you want to do it in Swedish instead, you would sign up on uh, clickyforlaget.se. Uh, do you do courses in Swedish? Yes, I do. Most of the courses uh, are in, in, in Swedish. Do you find them on uh, klickeforlaget.se um, and on apotekingtevadafest.se, which is the Swedish version of the book. All the English courses are found on retrievingforallocations.com. So let's see, I have been heavily reinforcing if you have something in your mouth, bring it to me. Great. Now my dog brings me any garbage she can find. My socks, boots, a ham, it's once. Yeah, <laughs> I want to stop this unsolicited retreat by not reinforcing it without spoiling delivery to ham. Is it possible? Yes. Yes, you, you will actually end up in that, that situation after a while. And that is when I actually in at least indoors, stop rewarding them for bringing me everything. I would just go, oh, okay, thank you, and put it away. Uh, and then it tends to, to disappear. What it usually happens, well, what usually happens is that that behavior will come back when the dog wants something. Perhaps it's a bit bored. You've been sitting by your desk for a long time working uh, and it wants something to happen. Then it's, uh, the dog has realized that this is a great way to get things to happen. So it starts to bring you stuff. Uh, so then you might 
start to, to do something and take it out or something like that and just keep those uh, rewards of any unsolicited trades. But I would stop reinforcing them, all of them, uh, at, at least indoors. If you notice that the retrieves are getting worse outdoors and the dog is deteriorating in its behavior, I would start rewarding them again, of course. But yes, if you're, well, if you're getting tired of getting too much stuff, just, you know, reward a bit less. Okay, so I think that's about sums it up for tonight. Um, so what's left, if that you're interested in uh, the course, just take action, go into the retrievingforallocations.com website and sign up for the course. And before you leave, I'd be very happy if you could just write in the chat what you're taking with you from this webinar tonight. What is the most important thing that you take with you from the webinar tonight? Positivity. Yes, that's a really good one. Happy to hear that. Stay with it, be flexible, and it will end up a super happy puppy and me. Yeah. Increased motivation. Yep. Start with minimal distraction and make it fun, confidence and motivation. Reward the puppy when she volunteers to bring something to you. Yep. Very good. I like your framework, easy to remember and very usable. Uh, patience and motivation, fun for Pop and you, definitely. Oh, yes, uh, just a question about the replay. Yes, there will be a replay available. As soon as Zoom has uh, processed uh, the recording, I will send you an email of where to find the replay. I should keep rewarding retrieves to hand, fun for Pop and you, yes, great, the sun. <laughs> Definitely, that's a good thing to bring with you. Great. So thank you very much. I hope to meet you again in the future, either IRL if you're traveling to Sweden or online. So uh, have a, well, a good day or good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. And thank you very much for today. Bye.